terras e águas do entorno é muito mais do que um simples ponto. É todo um mundo para baleias e golfinhos, tartarugas e morcegos, peixes e aves marinhas. É um verdadeiro ponto de esperançar, onde a luta contra as toneladas de lixo despejados no oceano todos os anos ganha força, onde pesquisas encontram respostas para enfrentar ameaças tanto de agressivas espécies invasoras quanto do descaso do ser humano com o planeta em que vive. E para essa luta é preciso dar as mãos, as mãos invisíveis da esperança. A esperança é famosa por ser a última né, a morrer, mas eu acho que ela não morre nunca. Estamos nós aqui dando as mãos, né? Acho que isso que, que é bonito, fiquei até arrepiada. <risos> é, então, para falar um pouco mais da, de, desse programa, né, dessa estratégia é, dos pontos de esperança, dos hope spots, é, uma das, das singularidades de, desse programa é que qualquer um de nós pode submeter essa nomeação de um lugar especial. E aí eu reforço aqui o convite de tantos outros lugares que a gente pode ter esperança. E vou pedir, então, para passar um vídeo é, da, da, da Mission Blue, e, na sequência, eu chamo a fala da, da doutora Silvia. It's taken more than 4 billion years for the ocean to arrive at the state that we enjoy today. It's taken us about four and a half decades to significantly unravel those systems that make Earth habitable for us and the rest of life on Earth as we know it. The next 10 years will really determine the outcome of the next 10,000 years. Mission Blue was founded in 2009 to develop a network of hope spots, protected areas in critically vulnerable parts of the ocean. There are now over 140 hope spots globally, and more to come. It's really about developing a network of people who are inspired to make a difference through their actions. Getting people around the world to come together, to use their knowledge, to use their desire to do something positive. And to inspire others to do the same. What can they do to turn things from this into a time of recovery? That is the goal. That's what will make a living ocean perpetual. Agora, então, tenho a honra de convidar a doutora Silvia é, oceanógrafa, exploradora em residência da National Geographic, nomeada cientista-chefe da NOAA e reconhecida, nomeada pela Time Magazine como primeira heroína do planeta. Her deepness, please, stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. I apologize that I speak in English. 
I speak well, a little bit of fish. Um, <laughs> I thank you for having me here to celebrate this moment in time. It is, I think, the best time ever, the best chance we will ever have, we 21st century human beings. I was listening to the presentations this morning. I thought, just imagine if we could have that knowledge, that information, that insight in 1992 when nations came together here in this city to deliberate really for the first time in a, in a global way. How do we have a sustainable, livable planet where we can thrive, understanding that it, nature must thrive if we are to thrive? The principal individual who was behind the concept of Rio, the, the Rio Conference of, on Sustainable, on Sustainable Development, back in 1992 was Maurice Strong. He was a businessman. He was also an environmental hero, conservationist. He made his fortune with Petro Canada. The oil industry made him wealthy, but he was wealthy in other ways. Wealthy in terms of trying to understand where is our place? He, like I, like all of you, were witnesses to this most remarkable time in the history of our species. When you think of what we know, what the kids of today know, that nobody knew in the middle of the 20th century or any time in the history of humankind before, now, you think about Einstein was really smart, <laughs> but he'd never seen Earth from space. That didn't happen until this picture. Oops. It was transformative. 1968. I had the privilege of meeting the astronaut Bill Anders, who took this photo. Him, NASA did not want him to take the camera that he wanted to take with a long lens, but finally they relented, and therefore we have this photograph. Imagine if we did not know what Earth looks like from space, but we do. And it changed not everything, because we still have a lot that we have to change <laughs> if we are going to succeed in finding harmony between ourselves and nature. But we're off to a great start. And by 1992, laws were beginning to change. Even the education was beginning to change, but I agree so wholeheartedly with one of the comments made this morning that we need, with the children, of course they have to learn letters, of course they have to learn numbers, they have to learn about the history of humans, their culture, art, music. But all of us, it doesn't matter how old or how young we are, we must come to grips with the fact that everything we care about is dependent on taking care of the natural systems that make Earth habitable. In talking with astronauts, it's become pretty obvious that their first priority when they go up in the sky is much like my first priority when I go down in the ocean in a submarine or even using scuba. You have to take care of your life support system. <laughs> if you don't, there's not much else you need to worry about. <laughs> if it fails, you fail. So all the things you care about don't matter if you can't breathe. If a doctor tells you, you 
Yeah, you, you look as though you're doing pretty well, but you have a you have a bad problem. But here are the things you have to do if you're going to survive more than a few months. Now you can breathe. You're you're walking around, but let me tell you, you've got a serious problem. And if you don't change, like right now, your time is very short. Now here are the things that you must do, you must do. Here we are. <laughs> we have a planet that's sick. There are things the planet can fix itself if we just leave it alone, leave, give nature a break. It's one thing that Jane Goodall commented on when she wrote her book about the reasons for hope. It's the human mind, the ability to figure out things. It's the, the idea that we, we can engineer solutions to problems. But one of the most important things she focused on was the resilience of nature. The ability, if we just give nature a break, protect what exists, and restore health to what we can, things we know what to do, stop the harm and begin the cure. We have the best chance we will ever have. Imagine if we could have started back in 1992 or any time in the past, but we cannot go back. All we can do is say, okay, here we are, 21st century human beings, let's get on with it, especially the kids, because their century, their time is just beginning and they have the power of knowing. So do you, more than any who have ever lived in times past. That's a gift. Let's not squander this moment in time. Can we go to the next image? I don't think I can change things, but you can back there. You know, I'm privileged, I know it. I enjoy the privilege of having come along at just the right time when people were able to get under the surface of the ocean. It wasn't that long ago. I first breathed air underwater in the 1950s, 1952. You know, 52, 72, 82, 92, 2002, 2012, I think of these 10-year leaps in time as we measure time. And it was just such a transformative experience. You go to the next. I mean, the idea that we can be where most of life on Earth exists can change to the next. Maybe, if it's working. <laughs> I hope it's working. <laughs> and then going a step further, like the astronauts, lucky creatures who are able to go up in the sky and stay, not just a bounce back, like a diver bounces down, spends a little time, comes back. No, to be able to live high in the sky, to really savor the experience of going around the world and looking at the world with new eyes, being able to live underwater. Next, please. To be able to stay day and night, get to know the creatures who live there. There are no creatures up in the sky, as far as we know beyond where birds and bees I, I think I'm okay now. <laughs> but to be able not only to go underwater, but to share the view. With that kind of equipment, I could speak by satellite to people all over the world. I actually participated in a television communication next while I was underwater. I mean, it was just something that was unimaginable when I was a child. But most of all, the opportunity to get to see life in the sea from their perspective. Again, thinking about Jane Goodall, the ability to spend years in one place getting to know one species, chimpanzees, pretty well. I mean, others do this too. I think about George Schaller getting to know pandas, getting to know snow leopards. On the land, you have that capacity to, you know, 
as air breathers, we can look at our fellow air breathers, whether they're birds or bats or bees or, <laughs> or mammals what, or trees or whatever. But underwater, we are really newcomers. And yet that's where the greatest diversity and abundance of life actually exists. We're just coming to grips with the importance of protecting nature, the fabric of life, made up not just of individual species, but individual individuals. I mean, don't you think that every one of you counts for something? It's all about people, humans. We want to save humans, but you want to be around too, right? As an individual, no two humans are alike and no two fish are either. No two chimpanzees. Jane Goodall brought focus to that awareness that together we make up a society, together we make up a culture, together we make up civilization. There are civilizations out there in the sea. Whales have language, they have culture, they have communication in, in ways that we can only imagine. And it's true with fish. Too. I mean, we're just beginning to glimpse their societies, their communication, their senses that transcend what any of us can know and feel. But we're on the brink of either losing many species, a million are on the line. We could lose a million at least. That's largely not even accounting for what we're losing in the ocean. By the end of this century, this ocean century, it doesn't have to be that way. Next, please. Getting to view creatures in the sea with the same kind of empathy that we have developed for cats, for dogs, for horses, for pandas, for elephants, it's not perfect by a lot. But we're getting to understand and recognize the importance of, of life, not just in terms of numbers, not just qu the quanti quantifying of the importance of this species or that, what's their role, how does it matter to us, but you want to ask, who are you? How do you live your days and nights? Where did you come from? I mean, do a better job of having a peaceful relationship with ourselves if we'd ask that of other humans to be more sensitive to who they are, where they come from, and what makes them special. But I, you know, I apologize in a way because I must sound like an idiot talking about fish having feelings, fish having faces, fish having personality. <laughs> but I can't help it because as a witness, I, I can't not convey that. It's just what I have come to observe as a scientist, Anybody can do what a scientist does. Observe carefully. Report honestly what you see. That's the basic role of a scientist. Observe, learn, communicate. All of you can do that. Kids are natural scientists. We can go on next. So, okay, I won't belabor this. But I will say that one of the doctors telling the, us, we're keepers of the earth, one of the things we have to do is respect all forms of life, including ocean life as wildlife, not just as commodities, not just as something to be measured by the ton, not just something to be put on a plate, although people will continue to consume animals, plants. We are animals, we have to consume something. I wish I could photosynthesize, <laughs> but that's a trick no human has mastered yet. Next, please. And the whole chemistry of the planet is shaped by it being an eat and be eaten world. Big fish eat little fish, eat smaller fish, and we heard about that in presentations here this morning. It's the chemistry of Earth formed by life on Earth that sets this planet in a category apart from all those dead planets out there. There may be life elsewhere, but 
there aren't tuna anywhere except on this planet, along with us. Next. Again, as a witness, one of those privileged humans who's had the ability to harness technology and work with engineers to develop new technologies to go deep in the ocean. In this case, not so deep, only 400 meters. But it's deeper than I can go holding my breath. It's deeper than anybody can scuba dive. It's just at the edge of light, where light penetration gives way to the darkness of the deep sea, where most of life actually lives. When you think about that big thought, that it took me a while to get it into my head. OK, the active part where photosynthesis occurs is up there in the 100, even maybe down to 400 meters, 500, you know, there's a little bit of light, maybe just enough with the right pigments, the right chemistry to harness the sunlight's energy. And when you go down deeper, all the way to the greatest depths, and even up here in sunlit areas, there's another, there's another process called chemosynthesis. In the absence of sunlight to generate food from the basic elements, organic material, in the absence of light, in the absence of photosynthesis. It happens in the forest floor, in the Amazon forest. It happens in salt marshes. It happens in the mud around mangroves. Chemosynthesis, churning away, capturing carbon, generating food in a new process that really it's only come into focus. It hasn't really come into focus yet. When we start to say, OK, how does the planet work? Where is most of life on Earth? Lives in the dark. It lives below where sunlight shines. You dive into the ocean, as I've had a chance to do, not often enough, and I hope all of you will have a chance to do it so you can be a witness too, to from the surface to the greatest depths, there's life. In a place you can embrace with your arms, whether it's the mud in a mangrove forest, the wet sand where the tide comes in and out in what looks like perfectly clear water, but there's life, sometimes great diversity, a dozen or so phyla of animals. These big divisions of life can occupy a very small space in the ocean. But you might find places like coral reefs, kelp forests, where you could get as many as 30 or 35 of these big divisions of animal life. Think of this. All of the land put together, even the richest rainforests, all of the deserts, all of the places that we know and love on the land, they only can host maybe 15 of the phyla, the diverse categories of life. Where is the diversity of life on Earth? Big wedges of life? It's in the ocean. There are whole categories of life that never made it into freshwater or onto the land. So if we want to protect biodiversity, we really need to think about the ocean. Next. <laughs> we need to think about how do we get there. And again, I, we're all in this time of going high in the sky and communicating in ways we could not before. Not, only a small number of humans will ever be on the moon or even on a space station. Many of us get in an airplane. We can go as high in the sky as the great, greatest depths of the ocean, down, you know, 11,000 meters. That's where big airplanes, that's how I flew coming here, it was 11,000 meters high in the sky. <laughs> but only a small number of people have been to the deepest parts of the ocean so far. But this is early in the 21st century. Imagine, imagine, Rio plus 40, <clears throat> that phrase was uttered here this morning. <clears throat> Maybe by then, some of you will have made the trip to the deepest part of the ocean and come back. I mean, <laughs> round trips are the only trips that really count. <laughs> With National Geographic for five years, I had the pleasure of taking kids, teachers, a few CEOs, of course, some crusty scientists, 
in little one-person subs where you had to learn how to drive if you were going to make the descent. And they did it. So simple to drive, even a scientist could do it. And we have living proof. Five years going from place to place around the coastline of the United States to be witnesses, to establish baseline information down to a little more than 1,000 feet to about 500 meters was the maximum. But even that, 500 meters, when you think, how deep is the ocean? We're still up here nibbling around the surface. Next, please. But we're getting better. We're getting a lot better. The first chance I had to be in a submarine was 1968, the same year that that image of space was taken, uh, the image of Earth from space was taken. The technology has evolved enormously, just as the technology of going high in the sky has evolved enormously in your lifetime. So at least to get down to maybe 500 meters, it's increasingly possible. And just wait, because we have the capacity. We know what to do. We don't have the resources that have been invested in going high in the sky, let alone into space, to go explore the ocean, either personally or with robotic devices. But it's getting better. Next. I want to share with you if no sound, but if you can please see if this will play. To touch the, one more time. Uh, there we go. This is the Minister of the Environment for, from Ecuador. His first excursion below where he could go as a diver. He was a little apprehensive. But it didn't take long before the curiosity like a child, he was entranced. Okay, let's go to the next image because when we got to the bottom, that's when some magic happened. You never know what you're going to see or who will be there. Next, please. See that little white blob? See if we can make it come alive. T touch it again, please. There we go. It's a mola mola, an ocean sunfish. This is 1,000 feet down. This is 300 meters. And it looked like he was trying to bite his ear. <laughs> Actually, he was whispering, take care of the ocean, Mr. Minister. <laughs> and that's what happens to a new scuba diver, or even when you put a face mask on as a snorkeler transforming kids. We can go to the next, please. And to bring out the kid in anybody of any age by diving in. I say no child left dry. But that's true of everyone. We should all explore the blue part of our planet within the capability that we now have. It's a good start. And we have technology such as this beast built to explore down to 7,000 meters. That's not the deepest place. That's 11,000. But this is where deep sea mining between five and 7,000 meters is now, it's on the chopping block for deep sea mining. You know, as we're sitting here, the deliberations that are taking place with the International Seabed Authority in Jamaica to decide the fate of the seabed in half of the world. Next, please. This is that same instrument operating at about 7,000 meters in the clarion Clipperton zone that is in the crosshairs of exploitation. You can play that. And this is just a gentle touch on the bottom with this huge plume of sediment that is stirred up. Imagine if you're deliberately down there to gather up manganese nodules or to pry crusts off of seamounts or otherwise take from this area where we don't know a lot, but we do know it's not an empty, 
barren place, which is what we thought when the International Seabed Authority was formed. We thought no harm could be done if we are able someday to get down in the deep sea and take what is there. It's like looking at the big museums of art around the world and having an appetite for paint. You can pry the paint off the canvas. If there's a market for that paint, it doesn't matter how much of the art that's here is destroyed because we want the paint. We have a use for it right now. So much is going to be destroyed and we'll take so little out of the deep sea if we allow this mining process to take place. Again, it's the library of life is down there. What else could we learn? What else do we need to know? Of course, the just individual things, what, what do those shrimp do? What, what is this little creature? How does it live? What's its role? You know, all of us have a place in this amazing fabric of life. But we don't have the answers. We do know that more than 5,000 species, most of them without names, have been discovered recently in the clarion Clipperton zone. Next, please. But who are you? You know, you won't know. Where do, where, do you, where do you come from? How do you spend your days and nights? Look, this is a new way of looking at the world for resources, as we call it. Short-term focus on what we could use or what we could choose not to destroy. Let's see, you can probably identify the gray areas that are land. You can probably see from the, even the back of the room that the yellow, the gold places are cobalt rich crusts. The red spots, polymetallic sulfide vents, or at least where we think they are, where you could chop off the minerals that are there, bring them to the surface, destroy whatever, like you leave it as crumbling remains on the bottom of the ocean. The white part, that's where nations have jurisdiction. It's a lot of ocean. But take, take all of the land and all of the exclusive economic zones together, you've got about half the world. What remains is the global commons, where deep sea mining and industrial high seas fishing is now one of the things that we have to face going into the 21st century. Are we going to allow this to go on? Or are we going to listen to the doctor and say, you have to think differently. You have to change. You have to change or else your time is going to be short. And next, please. It's not just mining minerals, it's mining life. Life, industrial scale fishing, industrial scale taking of wildlife. When you say wildlife, what do you think about? You think about big trees, do you think about birds? think about elephants, lions, and tigers? Do you think about tuna? Do you think about orange ruffy, a creature given a marketing name so that it would be more saleable to a global audience? When the, given the name that scientists use for the fish that are captured in that net by the ton, the name slime head, slime head is used, orange ruffy. <laughs> We didn't know they even existed when I was a child. Nobody had been to the deep sea where these fish that are now in the marketplace globally, they live as long as humans, maybe even longer. And like humans, it take a long time to mature. But when they were first discovered, all that was thought about is what good are they? Can we market? Can we sell it? That's how we have viewed nature. Traditionally, what good is it to us? And if we can't figure out how to eat it or sell it or use it somehow, it's considered, it's considered whatever, yeah. expendable, expendable. And that's how we've treated the ocean. Next, please. Taking these miracles, I've, I've been with 
<laughs> engineers at MIT with tuna. They have constructed a robo tuna, manufactured tuna, to be able to see how do they swim, how do they move through the water with the efficiency that is greater than anything humans have been able to come up with. 97% efficiency is a speed through the water. They capture the energy created by little whirlpools when they put their tail back and forth. We know that now, but we still don't respect tuna, except for the most part. <laughs> How good do they taste? What can we sell them for? One tuna sold recently oh, in a market in Japan for like three million dollars. How can any tuna be safe when, when the price tag on its, on its body for food for luxury consumption is so high. Next, please. The same what used to be true with whales, that we only saw them as pieces of meat, pounds of, of bone or barrels of oil. It wasn't that long ago. And we did change. Next, please. Now we can see sperm whales. Those are the ones that were being chopped up in that previous image. I witnessed it early one morning in the last whaling station in Australia. But here, looking at them with new eyes, the biggest brain on the planet is contained within sperm whales. I don't know what they know. I don't know really how they communicate over long distances, but I do know that we're starting to ask those questions. And we've stopped killing them, generally speaking. Next. And we started to care. And, and to begin to see them as something that we should treasure. We treasure art, we treasure music, we treasure a lot of things. But to treasure nature, our fellow citizens, that's where we're headed next. Of course, people will eat animals, including wild animals, including fish. This kind of fishing is not really the problem. The local fishing to feed families. We, we've done that for all of our history. Just as we've taken birds, taken mammals, taken, taken, taken. But never before have we had the technology that enables us to find, capture, and market ocean wildlife on the scale that now affects climate. We heard something about that this morning. Blue carbon. It's in mangroves, of course. Next slide, please. It's in seagrass meadows. It's in marshes. Of course, it's in rainforests and other. But what we're putting into the sea, as well as what we're taking out of the sea, is interrupting those basic functions. Next, please. And we're responding, next, to the action. These are kids taking it upon themselves to get out there. And right here in Rio, I witnessed kids and some of the, their grown-up friends, moms and dads and others, who are out there doing exactly that, taking back what we put in the ocean that doesn't belong there. Next. So, what to do? I'm so pleased to hear solutions that were being offered today. What to do? It's not a new idea. National parks on the land, now a growing voice for parks in the sea, Back in, 19, in uh, 2017, there was an optimistic assessment that maybe as much as 6% of the ocean really had good protection. But we've been looking more carefully. So even now, years later, it's like 3% of the ocean is highly or fully protected. We want at least 10 times that in the next seven years by 2030. Next, please. And that's where hope spots come in. That's where World Wildlife Fund and Nature Conservancy, the Wildlife Conservation Society, where bankers, <laughs> where industries, where the government bodies around the world, where kids and teachers, where everybody comes in. What can we do? What can we do to restore nature, to save what remains of the good places that are out there and restore what we can. Why? Because if we want to be around for longer than this little window of time that we now can still breathe and still tolerate the current temperature, 
we will have to change. We have to. And it should not be a burden. We should say, I know what to do. And let's go do it next. To look at places next around the world, everywhere, the coastal waters of countries next and next. The polar regions have a magnified impact. And, you know, we have to come together because nobody really owns Antarctica. It is a global commons in a way. By international agreement, we agreed not to exploit the whole continent of Antarctica some years ago, but we kind of forgot about the ocean. Next. The same is true in the Arctic. The high Arctic, there's a bit of the high seas in the top of the world. Polar bears know that we're not taking care of their realm. Next. But we have the power right now to act, to protect what remains, to take the pressure off. Why are we even thinking of going to Antarctica to take krill or deep sea fish or to do what some companies in some countries aspire to do? Let's go drill for oil. Let's go extract minerals from the high seas around Antarctica. There's a certain amount of governance there. Brazil has a voice in the governance, along with countries around the world who have taken part in the agreement for the governance of conservation of Antarctica. But we have to step up with that vision in mind we have to change our attitude about nature, that we can't continue to exploit, exploit, exploit. At least we should know before we go. And most of what <laughs> we know about the ocean is a paragraph as compared to the volumes we have about the land. So this is one place, Cabo Pomo in Mexico, where the fishermen themselves came together when they're source of their economy, their livelihoods, disappeared. I mean, it did. They saw it. They, the fish got smaller and smaller. They had to go further and further offshore. They came together. It's a hope spot now, but it started with the fishermen themselves who said, we can't live like this. And they transformed their economy to something where they could make a good living by crazy people such as I, who will pay big bucks to go be swimming in their beautiful ocean. They opened restaurants and serviced those people such as I, who would go. There are solutions. Next, please. We listen to the whales. It used to be, what's a whale worth? Dead. Climate scientists now are looking at whales for their carbon value. A trillion dollars is the value that the International Monetary Fund put on living whales for their carbon. <laughs> well, that's a dollar measure, but what can't you measure in terms of dollars alone? What's a whale worth alive? I guess priceless. Next, please. But we're starting to ask these questions. Next. Same with seagrasses. What are they worth? Carbon? Next, please. Kelp forests, you can touch that again just to take us into the kelp forest. They're in the crosshairs now of protection. About half of them are gone already. About half the coral reefs, half the seagrass meadows, and the mangroves globally lost before we knew what we now know about why we should care. Next. And the forests in the sea, next please. Those little guys that we heard about this morning, those powerhouses, here you see the food chain in action. We talked about the, the food chain, the passage of energy from phytoplankton to zooplankton to the big fish and sometimes back to us. But if we keep them in the ocean, instead of allowing their carbon to go back into the atmosphere as methane and carbon dioxide, when we take them out by the ton, just think, We've disrupted the natural systems when we remove so much. 90% of the sharks are already gone. Next. And the same is true with so many species. We know how to kill. We know how to market. 
we've got to get better about respecting the other values. These kids, this is Hong Kong. This is wildlife trade central for the planet. You can buy anything and almost anybody in Hong Kong. But the kids love sharks. And they're saying, enough already. Next. It's happening not just in Hong Kong, it's happening all over the world. Like dinosaurs, kids love sharks. If you left it to the kids, nobody would ever hurt a shark. Next. We have around the world now, not 140, but 155 hope spots. South Africa is one of the places where we have six hope spots along the coast. Next, please. And the kids are very much a part of the action. And they are here in Rio as well. And I have had the pleasure of meeting some of the kids on the beach. Next, please. And I, everywhere you go, meeting kids who are entranced with life in the sea. Next, please. Want to know, what are you, jellyfish? Next, please. Even phytoplankton is being celebrated by some kids with t-shirts that have the name Prochlorococcus. I mean, what is that? If you like to breathe, figure it out. Next. So, this is just day before yesterday. And one of your fellow citizens, somewhere in the audience, <laughs> is among the movers and shakers, Felipe Prufo, a businessman, working with World Wildlife and now working with Mission Blue to help change this trajectory. I mean, I, I talked about it in that little Rolex film, but I, I've yet heard all of you talk about it. We're on a track going in this direction, but it doesn't have to be that way. We have the power to change. That's cause for hope. Thank you. Todo mundo arrepiado, limpando as lágrimas. <risos> a gente vai passar um último vídeo para mostrar essa experiência incrível que a gente teve com a doutora Silvia nas Ilhas Cagarras. O primeiro mergulho dela no Brasil. Foi uma, uma honra incrível. E essa uma grande ajuda para a gente alavancar a conservação marinha no Rio e no Brasil todo. Obrigada, Silvia. Representando a senhora Tainá de Paula, que é a secretária de Ambiente e de Clima da, da cidade do Rio de Janeiro. Ela, infelizmente, não pôde comparecer, mas, felizmente, a gente tem aqui o, o subsecretário de, de Biodiversidade, o senhor Hélio Vanderlei, é arquiteto, urbanista, e representando muito bem aqui a secretaria. Muito obrigada pela presença. Você pode falar aqui dentro. É, bom dia a todos e todas. É, é um momento de motivação, né? A Silvia nos motiva, nos empolga, nos empurra e diz: é possível sim fazer a diferença. Seja nossas crianças, seja nossos trabalhadores, seja nossas comunidades, seja o poder público, todos têm que entender que esse planeta precisa de cuidado e nós somos os médicos, os cirurgiões, nós somos os técnicos de enfermagem. Nós somos aqueles que podem fazer essa engrenagem mudar. É, em nome da Ternet de Paula, que se encontra em viagem, eu queria agradecer essa oportunidade e passei a manhã toda ouvindo, percebendo e sentindo como a questão do mar nos motiva. Sabe por quê? Porque nós somos primatas. Nós estamos na origem. Nós somos parte do planeta. E sentir o planeta seja nas florestas, seja nos desertos, nos mangues, nos motiva. Mas como transformar a ciência em política pública? Esse é o grande desafio. Nós sabemos os problemas, ou não sabemos? Nós estudamos, nós pesquisamos, mas nós precisamos dar um passo além da motivação. Nós precisamos dar um passo além do debate, um passo além da pesquisa. E a Tainá quando montou a sua equipe, ela disse, olha, nós precisamos dar um passo além. E esse passo é trabalhar com as comunidades. Quando a gente cria, e ela criou, os guardiões do mangue, 
A percepção da Tainá era envolver a comunidade que mora perto do mangue, que conhece o mangue, que observa o mangue, que tem a percepção, mas que estava distante. E aí você transforma isso em políticas públicas de ação prática, de observação e de conhecimento e de resultados. Então, se você quer uma comunidade envolvida com as florestas, se você quer, em cada favela, uma floresta, as pessoas têm que entender a importância da biodiversidade, do seu território. E que cada ser humano é importante naquele ecossistema. E cada ser vivo é importante. O nosso programa de mutirão, Refloresta Rio, 37 anos, passou por governos, passou por pessoas, e é um sucesso. Por quê? Porque a política pública, os governantes entenderam que é um programa de Estado e que tem que permanecer crescendo, criando novas florestas com biodiversidade. Administrar uma cidade, que é um corpo doente, permanentemente doente, porque nós, seres humanos, queremos nos apropriar daquele corpo maior que é a vida. E é óbvio, isso está no DNA humano, se apoderar do outro, do ecossistema, do bioma. E um desafio que a Tainá nos colocou foi, Hélio, até o final desse ano, eu gostaria de ter o termo de referência para o Plano Municipal de Gerenciamento Costeiro, uma coisa que a cidade do Rio não tem. Além da cidade do Rio, tem 24 cidades no estado do Rio de Janeiro que não tem um plano. E nem o estado do Rio de Janeiro também tem um plano de gerenciamento costeiro. Então, isso é formular políticas públicas e envolver as comunidades. E ela disse, chama as universidades, todas. E vamos entender o que cada universidade está fazendo em pesquisa e como a Secretaria de Meio Ambiente pode é, potencializar essas pesquisas, transformando em conhecimento e levar as crianças a conhecer a pesquisa Ciência Cidadã. Em conversa com a UERJ, estamos discutindo utilizar o navio oceanográfico para que as crianças possam ir para o mar. Você imagina a percepção de uma criança se afastando da terra e olhando Copacabana, olhando Ipanema, olhando Sepitiba, Grumari, essa percepção que a criança vai ter, é aí que a Itainá quer chegar, no coração de cada criança, para que ela motivada volte e diga para o seu colega, temos que preservar o mar, porque eu vi baleia, eu vi golfinhos, eu vi um território que está além das minhas pernas que é o mar. Um ser desconhecido. Então, a Tainá sempre conversa muito com a gente, a equipe técnica, os subsecretários, e toda a equipe diz, gente, não podemos ficar teorizando a vida inteira. Nós estamos aqui para formular políticas públicas e parceria com a sociedade. É preciso ouvir os pescadores, as ONGs, as universidades, os empreendedores, todos devem estar sentados, construindo o único caminho que é da preservação, através não só da mobilização, mas das políticas públicas, com investimentos públicos. E além dos guardiões do, do mangue, temos os guardiões dos rios, que cuidam dos nossos rios, que dialogam com a comunidade. Você sabe de onde vem o plástico? Que vai para o mar? Do interior, dos corpos hídricos. Seja de Nova Iguaçu, do de Caxias, São João de Miti, de todas as cidades das bacias hidrográficas que drenam para o Rio de Janeiro, para o nosso mar. Então, é preciso dialogar de uma forma territorial. E isso o nosso prefeito tem dito constantemente. É preciso que a gente ultrapasse o nosso limite de território e dialogue com outros municípios de políticas públicas de vanguarda para o bem-estar coletivo. Não quero fazer uma palestra, mas me empolgo, porque nesses 35 anos de, como ambientalista e 63 de vida, a minha esposa sempre diz... Nossa, bem, você sempre acorda motivado, empolgado. E eu diz, digo para ela, é respirar vida. Porque se você parar de respirar cinco minutos apenas, puf, a vida se foi. Se você deixar de consumir água por alguns dias, puf, a vida se foi. Se você não cuidar do corpo, do planeta, puf, os humanos vão embora. Não é o planeta que vai embora. Acho até que ele vai agradecer. Essa espécie que está aí, olha, não foi muito boa, não. Vamos ver se aparece uma outra espécie que, que vai conviver com esse planeta. Então, fazer políticas públicas 
é construir diálogo com a sociedade, é definir com as ONGs, com as universidades, de forma pragmática, os investimentos que a gente precisa fazer. E aí está ligado o clima, que eu também tenho uma rede de monitoramento com a qualidade do ar, que está sobre a minha gestão, e eu digo para a minha equipe, analisem, não o clima apenas desse território, onde estão os equipamentos. Vamos olhar todo o território da cidade do Rio de Janeiro e dialogar com o INEA para a gente ampliar a nossa rede de monitoramento com a qualidade do ar. Quer melhorar a qualidade do ar? Coloque o transporte público, cada vez mais... O BRT é um caminho, mas temos que avançar, integrar, facilitar. Nossa rede de ciclovias, ampliar para que os trabalhadores possam ter bicicletário do lado do metrô, do lado do BRT, que possam fazer seus roteiros com a sua bicicleta. Então, a administração pública tem um desafio gigantesco, vou encerrar por aqui, porque senão vou ficar aqui uma hora com um bom pernambucano que só adoro falar. Eu sou um bom vendedor de sonho. Aquele que motiva, aquele que pulsiona, aquele que chama... Aquele que reúne e vamos juntos, porque juntos nós podemos fazer muito mais. Sozinho, faremos muito pouco. Individualmente, somos nada. Então, Silvia, você é inspiradora, como todos vocês são inspiradores. Como todas as comunidades tem alguém que nos inspira. E deveremos ter o prêmio das pessoas inspiradoras das comunidades, das favelas, das periferias, homens, mulheres, pretos que lutam pela preservação do meio ambiente das nossas florestas. Viva a biodiversidade carioca! Viva o Rio de Janeiro! Viva os oceanos! Obrigado! Então, viva o vídeo agora, que ele vai passar com a biodiversidade toda. Vamos lá! Fé! E para fazer o um encerramento, a gente tem uma surpresa, foi um, é um, uma grande satisfação para a gente contar aí com, com esse encerramento do Eduardo Cavalieri, da Casa Civil da Prefeitura do Rio de Janeiro. Muito obrigada por ter vindo e fortalecendo esse evento. E, e é isso, vamos fortalecer aí a, a conservação marinha no Rio e no Brasil. Por favor. Bom, primeiro, primeiro, boa tarde a todos, boa tarde a todas aqui. É uma, uma imensa honra né, estar aqui hoje e vejo várias pessoas queridas, muita gente que né, contribui para que, que a cidade do Rio de Janeiro possa avançar, em especial nessa agenda tão importante né, do clima e saudar aqui especialmente né, algumas dessas pessoas, claro, não vou poder cumprimentar todo mundo, mas dizer que são... Né, sem dúvida, pessoas que são parte, Silvia, do que a cidade do Rio de Janeiro tem de melhor para oferecer para o mundo. E aí, né, essa inspiração que a Aline e o Clério, Caio, que estão aqui, né, entre vários cientistas, pesquisadores, acadêmicos, né, pessoas que oferecem para a sociedade civil, para a Academia do Rio e do Brasil, né, o que tem de melhor. E a gente, né, aqui o professor Sérgio Besserman também, e o Felipe, né, que nos apresentou aqui em algum momento para a gente avançar mais, dizer né, o quanto que governo, sociedade civil e academia podem trabalhar juntos né, para a gente avançar. Acho que esse, essa mensagem é fundamental. E aí saudar, né, acho que a gente tem aqui né, a imensa honra de receber a cientista, a professora Silvia Earle, né, que nos inspira a todos 
e que, como ela bem falou, e aí aproveito para fazer a menção, né, o que poderia ser mais incrível num projeto como esse do que espalhar pontinhos de esperança pelo mundo, mesmo que as cidades e que os lugares não estejam ainda preparados para recebê-los, mas para chamar a atenção da academia, chamar a atenção da imprensa, chamar a atenção dos governantes. E aí esse é o, o papel de quem está no poder público, mas de ter a sensibilidade né, de entender até onde chegamos, aquilo que muitos já fizeram para a gente estar tá aqui, e o que, que a gente pode oferecer para a sociedade, né, para que a gente olhe para frente. E essa palavra esperança foi a marca né, da, do material que a Prefeitura lançou no Dia Mundial do Meio Ambiente, em 2021, né, que hoje é visto como um material de planejamento referência no mundo, que é o Plano de Desenvolvimento Sustentável e Ação Climática, que apresenta caminhos, estabelece metas claras, estabelece prioridades, e governar é estabelecer prioridades para que a gente consiga alcançar as metas né, que tanto a sociedade, que tanto a ciência nos cobra nos próximos anos. E aí, Silvia, você nos homenageia vindo no Rio de Janeiro, mergulhando aqui, né, vindo nessa, nessa cidade incrível, mas acho que é papel nosso também deixar você com um pouquinho de esperança e sabendo que aqui na cidade do Rio a gente entendeu o recado, né, aqui na cidade do Rio né, é uma cidade que se preparou desde 92 né, para continuar avançando na agenda climática. Eu faço questão de fazer essa menção só aqui hoje, pelo menos do que eu estou vendo, tem dois ex-secretários de meio ambiente, além de mim, está né, aqui o Lucas Padilha, que foi secretário de meio ambiente, está aqui o Bernardo Egas, que foi secretário de meio ambiente, e o prefeito da nossa cidade, o prefeito Eduardo Paes, também foi secretário de meio ambiente há 20 anos atrás. Então é uma cidade que né, respira né, a agenda climática, a agenda ambiental, no cotidiano da política. Né, onde as transformações né, que estão em disputa podem, sim, né, acontecer. Eu queria muito rapidamente mencionar algumas dessas iniciativas, que a partir né, da provocação, né, a partir dos estudos, a partir né, das orientações da ciência, a cidade do Rio de Janeiro, nos últimos três anos, né, implementou, sempre com o guia do Plano de Desenvolvimento Sustentável, que vai guiar a cidade, é um material, um planejamento estratégico, o professor Jeffrey Sachs, né, num evento com o prefeito Eduardo Paes, algumas semanas atrás, em Paris, onde eles lançavam junto com a prefeita Hidalgo né, um, um banco de financiamento climático para as cidades, o professor Jeffrey Sachs pegou o Plano de Desenvolvimento Sustentável e a Ação Climática da cidade do Rio de Janeiro e falou isso aqui é política pública que olha para o futuro, né, que estabelece metas claras e diz precisamos agir agora. Se a gente não se unir, se as gerações não se unirem para agir agora, a gente não vai conseguir enfrentar os desafios dos extremos climáticos. E nesse, nesse material, professora, né, a gente, nos últimos três anos, a partir desse planejamento, a gente criou cinco unidades de conservação na cidade do Rio de Janeiro, a Prefeitura do Rio, cinco unidades de conservação terrestres e uma unidade de conservação, né, criando um santuário de vida marinha, aí, sem dúvida nenhuma, né, inspirado né, pelo dia 17 de abril de 2021, 16 de abril de 2021, quando né, a, gente, a cidade né, tomou conhecimento, se tornou público, né, esse pontinho de esperança nas Ilhas Cagarras, nas áreas né, vizinhas às Ilhas Cagarras, no Parque Paisagem Carioca. E um ano depois, com estudos, com planejamento, com todo o envolvimento da sociedade civil, né, a Prefeitura criou em 2022, em agosto de 2022, eu já não era mais secretário de meio ambiente, já estava disputando a eleição, já tinha saído, mas o trabalho continuou. Eu acho que essa é a mensagem importante. Com planejamento, né, com os técnicos da prefeitura, com os concursados, com a sociedade civil, né, um ano depois se criou o Santuário de Vida Marinha, né, pegando a área do entorno do, do Pão de Açúcar, né, ali reunindo, que aliás é um grande santuário de biodiversidade, como vários mencionaram aqui, onde... A professora mergulhou na foto que estava ali com o Felipe. É, e por que, que isso é tão importante para uma cidade como o Rio de Janeiro? E aí, muito rapidamente, né, o Rio de Janeiro pode ser, e esse é o, o papel né, de uma cidade como o Rio, pode ser um grande laboratório de soluções né, na, área, na agenda climática, não só para o Brasil, mas para o mundo. A gente tem um ecossistema ultra complexo, uma cidade espremida entre o mar e a montanha, 
né, em que a gente pode experimentar soluções, enfrentar os nossos problemas. É bom dizer, né, a gente tem muito problema e precisamos, precisamos avançar muito. Imagina, a cidade do Rio, na primeira metade do século XX, foi a cidade com a taxa de urbanização mais rápida da história das civilizações recentes, das cidades né, que se adensaram recentemente nos últimos anos. Né, a gente precisa enfrentar os problemas de uma cidade, um grande centro urbano, 7 milhões de pessoas na cidade, quase 13 milhões de pessoas vivendo em torno da Baía de Guanabara e, claro, muitos problemas. Mas, com um plano de voo e com metas claras, eu tenho certeza que a gente consegue olhar para frente com esperança. Para isso, né, a criação de unidades de conservação, o plano de desenvolvimento sustentável, para isso, né, o envolvimento com a sociedade civil e com a academia. E aí, uma última iniciativa que eu queria mencionar, que a gente estabeleceu na cidade do Rio de Janeiro esse ano, né, a Universidade de Colômbia, que já tem uma parceria com a cidade do Rio de Janeiro nos últimos dez anos, né, um centro de pesquisa, de conhecimento aqui no Rio, o Colômbia Global Center, criou no Rio de Janeiro um centro, né, o Rio Climate Hub, um centro de pesquisa, um centro de inteligência, de informação né, na área de clima, e uma das linhas de pesquisa que a gente lançou com os 3 milhões de dólares que o prefeito Eduardo Paes está investindo no, no Rio Climate Hub vai ser pesquisa, desenvolvimento de pesquisa e conhecimento na vida marinha, né, para que a gente possa avançar. E um dos projetos que a gente, talvez o primeiro que esteja já em fase de consolidação, vai ser o Ilhas do Rio. Então, né, se isso ainda não era público, é bom que a gente torne público aqui, mas né, vão ter pesquisadores vindo de Colômbia, vindo dos Estados Unidos para cá, a gente vai enviar pesquisadores daqui do Rio né, para os Estados Unidos. Vamos financiar né, papers, artigos científicos nessa área, na área de conservação da vida marinha. E uma, uma informação interessante dessa parceria com Colômbia e com Nova York é que são duas cidades que contam com hope spots, que, na verdade, são hope spots urbanos, né, com o desafio da gente ter que enfrentar o problema né, de jogar esgoto em natura ainda né, em algumas regiões da cidade, na Baía de Guanabara, com o emissário de Ipanema, né, que sai pertinho das Ilhas Cagarras. Né, quanto mais sociedade civil cobrando, quanto mais academia produzindo conhecimento, quanto mais gente cobrando compromisso dos governantes, eu tenho certeza que a gente vai avançar mais. Né, e nos próximos anos, eu, e a professora vai ter muito orgulho né, desse Hope Spot aqui na cidade do Rio de Janeiro, porque a gente conseguiu avançar. Então, né, é sempre fundamental né, a gente parar um pouquinho para olhar para frente. É né? claro que os problemas do dia a dia né, são, são, precisam ser enfrentados, mas visão de longo prazo, né, um olhar estratégico para uma cidade como o Rio de Janeiro, né, que sediou a Rio 92, que foi um local de grandes encontros, que tem um papel de protagonismo global na área climática, é fundamental. E eu não tenho nenhuma dúvida né, que a vida marinha, que a conservação dos oceanos na década dos oceanos da ONU é uma agenda estratégica para o Rio de Janeiro e a gente pode contribuir não só para o Brasil, como para o mundo. Conte com a gente, né, o prefeito né, agradece muito a visita né, de cada um de vocês que estão aqui hoje né, e contem com a gente para apoiar cada vez mais a sociedade civil e a academia para a gente desenvolver conhecimento autêntico a partir do Rio de Janeiro para o mundo. Obrigado e seja sempre bem-vinda. Volte mais. Alô? Ah, pronto. É, agora, acho que estamos bem, né? Todo mundo com fome. <risos> Mas é, a nossa equipe vai direcionar vocês para a escada, vocês que vocês subiram pela rampa. Aí, quem quiser conhecer um pouco mais das nossas iniciativas de educação ambiental, a gente está inaugurando hoje a exposição Esperança nas Águas e Ilhas do Rio. Né, que fala desse hope spot, dessa biodiversidade toda. É uma exposição que está sendo realizada em parceria com o ICMBio, com Mônica Garrastat. Valeu demais. É, contamos com a parceria do Museu Nacional, através da sessão de ensino. Está aí o Fernandinho, muita gente, né? a Débora, a, tinha a Cris também lá atrás. É assim que a gente faz ciência e divulga esse conhecimento para todo mundo. Obrigada a todo mundo e vamos lá almoçar. Obrigada.